OHSS, or ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, is a rare but serious complication of IVF. I'm Dr. Laura Shaheen. I'm a fertility doctor helping people for almost 20 years with IVF, and I have seen in my own career a dramatic improvement in prevention and care of OHSS. I remember in the early days, it was not uncommon to have a patient in the hospital recovering from OHSS from their IVF cycle. And in my practice now, I honestly can't remember the last time we had to admit someone to the hospital for this reason. It is important to learn about this and discuss it with your IVF doctor before you start your cycle. There are key prevention and treatment options that can keep you safe. In this video, we're going to go over understanding exactly what OHSS is and who is at risk and some of the prevention and treatment options. In another video, I go through what you as the patient can do to advocate for your care ask questions and take care of yourself at home in recovery to prevent some of the side effects with OHSS. We're going to go over four main topics in this video. Number one, we're going to talk about exactly what OHSS is. Number two, we're going to talk about causes and physiology of OHSS. Number three, we're going to go into detail and who exactly is at risk for the serious side effects of OHSS. And number four, we're going to go over treatment options. This is key to preventing some of the risks of OHSS. Let's get started. Topic number one, what is OHSS? OHSS stands for ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. It is a rare but serious complication from the ovarian stimulation that we do in assisted reproduction for IVF. It occurs in one to 5% of all IVF cycles. Some studies say as high as 10%, and it can be classified as mild, moderate, or severe. A quick review of ovarian ovarian stimulation for IVF and its purpose. In IVF, the goal is to retrieve multiple eggs because not every egg is perfect and not every egg is going to result into a beautiful embryo that results in a live birth. So in general, the more eggs you can get, the better chance you have of having a baby with one egg retrieval. The way that we do this, is we give the body gonadotropins. They are hormones that typically come from the pituitary gland to talk to the ovary to recruit one egg each cycle. But we typically have more than one egg that's up for grabs. And so this process is taking advantage of that opportunity. So if you give a higher dose of gonadotropins, and then the eggs are going to respond and you could maybe get 10, 15, 20 eggs in one cycle. And remember, these are eggs that would be lost anyway, because we only ovulate one egg each month, but we're losing hundreds no matter what we're doing, whether we are ovulating or not. I have a lot of videos here all about IVF and trying to understand that process and the timeline and a lot of the decisions that have to be made with IVF, but I wanted to just review really quickly what's happening because with IVF, we are recruiting multiple eggs or more follicles than are typical in a cycle. Estrogen and progesterone levels are getting higher. The ovaries are enlarging because they're responding and they're recruiting multiple eggs. And so in a way, anyone going through IVF, if they're rec- recruiting more than one or two eggs is actually having hyperstimulation. What we're talking about is when people tip over into a lot of discomfort and side effects that can come with this process. OHSS can be classified as mild, moderate, or severe. Mild OHSS includes abdominal discomfort and bloating, mild nausea and vomiting, enlarged ovaries, and some shortness of breath. Moderate OHSS includes the symptoms listed above, but in addition to the mild symptoms, There can be ultrasound findings of free fluid in the pelvis, enlarged ovaries, and some laboratory findings such as hemoconcentration. One of the things that's going on with OHSS is that essentially the person feels bloated and full, but they're dehydrated. All the fluid is shifting into tissues and out of the bloodstream. And so you can see that on blood tests. Severe OHSS includes all of the symptoms listed above, but in addition to that, significant dehydration, inability to keep liquids foods down, significant shortness of breath, low urine output, and even more significant electrolyte shifts in the bloodstream and even more hemoconcentration in the labs. So significant laboratory findings in addition to the symptoms that a patient's having. So beyond severe OHSS, you can actually have critical OHSS, and that can include renal failure, blood clots, and respiratory distress syndrome. So that's the overview of OHSS and its classifications. But the second thing I want to go over is the physiology. Like what's 
actually going on with OHSS. So in this process, the body ends up making substances in a high concentration, something called VEGF, interleukin-1, and other interleukins, and insulin-like growth factor. These substances increase vasodilation in the bloodstream, and it causes the capillaries, the little tiny blood vessels in our organs, to get leaky. So a lot of the fluid is getting out of the bloodstream where it's needed to keep us hydrated and keep our organs perfused. And it's getting into the tissues. It's getting into the pelvis. When you talk about free fluid around the ovary, you can actually see fluid in the pelvis when you're doing an ultrasound and checking during IVF. So the patient feels bloated and feels full and swollen, but really they're actually very dehydrated. In medical school, I called this process third spacing. And all of this leads to all of these combined symptoms and findings. The ovaries being enlarged because they're being stimulated, the capillaries and blood vessels being leaky so that fluid is going into the pelvis so you feel even more full. You're dehydrated. If your ovaries are so enlarged and you feel so uncomfortable, you've got so much fluid, it's hard to keep liquids and food down. And so there's this cyclic process of trying to stay hard, to stay hydrated and get the nutrients and fluids that you need, but you just can't get it into your system fast enough. So see why this is so important to learn about because you really need to figure out who is at risk in order to prevent this from happening. And that leads into our third topic, who is at risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome? Just remember, everybody is at risk of OHSS and everybody going through IVF is going to feel some of these symptoms, like a little bit of abdominal bloating, a little bit of pelvic discomfort, fatigue. But OHSS is really something different and it is important to know who is at risk. There's several studies that look into this into detail and I've got them listed here. There are really five things to look for to identify patients that are at significant risk of OHSS. Number one, young age. There are several studies that look at this, but one in particular showed that women less than 35 years old were at 60% higher risk of getting OHSS. Number two, low BMI or low body weight put somebody at higher risk of OHSS. Again, several studies, but I found one that showed a BMI of less than 23 put people at significant risk of OHSS. Number three, patients with a high ovarian reserve are at higher risk of OHSS. It kind of makes sense. If you've got a lot of eggs up for grabs and you retrieve a lot of eggs, you have a lot more follicles, a lot more fluid shifts, a lot higher risk of feeling all these symptoms and getting OHSS. I'll show one study here that showed an increased risk if the, if the AMH is over five and another study here showing an antral follicle count of over 24 was associated with a higher risk of OHSS. If you want to have a deep dive into fertility testing, and ovarian reserve testing. I've got a video here that talks all about exactly what AMH is and antral follicle count. I hope that helps you. Number four, patients with PCOS have a higher risk of ovarian hyperstimulation. Now it makes sense because a lot of people with PCOS have a high antral follicle count and a high AMH, but there's something in addition to carrying the diagnosis of PCOS that puts people at also at increased risk. So someone could have an AMH of three, but have PCOS and you still should have a red flag of watching this patient very closely. And number five, another thing to look out for for patients in risk of OHSS is a high response to the IVF stimulation and the cycle. One study showed estradiol levels that get over 3,500 picograms per milliliter put patients at risk of OHSS. One study showed if a patient has more than 20 mature follicles coming forward when you're doing the measuring and getting ready for your trigger shot, that puts them at an increased risk of OHSS. And finally, another study looked at the actual number of eggs retrieved. And if someone has more than 15 eggs retrieved, they're at a higher risk of OHSS. All right. So, so far we've talked about what OHS is, the physiology physiology of OHSS and exactly who is at risk. Now for our final topic, we're going to talk about treatment, and this is extremely important. So when I think about treatment of OHSS, I think about two camps, prevention, so someone doesn't get it. And then I think about treatment. If someone does actually get OHSS, I want them to recover as fast as I can. So let's talk about prevention first. And there's four key factors. Number one, knowing who's at risk. Number two, choosing a protocol that will decrease their risk. Number three, there's medications and adjustments that you can make in the cycle to 
decrease the risk of it getting worse. And number four, you've always got to adjust and recalculate and see what is going on with the patient. So for these four things, for prevention, we've already talked about number one, who is at risk? Number two, choosing a protocol. So there's many different protocols in IVF and how you lead into the protocol, how you prevent the ovaries from ovulating, whether you give Lupron or an, an antagonist medication, which the brands are Cetratide and Generalix, the dose of the medication, the trigger shot, et cetera. Of the different protocols that are out there, there's evidence and it's been studied time and time again that choosing an antagonist protocol will decrease the patient's risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. There's a Cochrane Review article that reviewed over 73 randomized control trials looking at different protocols and risks of OHSS and the antagonist protocol came through with flying colors. There's two main reasons people think that it works better for OHSS. There's a slightly lower level of estradiol that's created. The ovaries just don't make as much estrogen when you choose the antagonist protocol. And then number two, the antagonist protocol allows you to use different options for the trigger medication. And that is really key. I'll talk about that in just a second. The third part about prevention, not just knowing who's at risk or choosing the right protocol, but number three is learning that there's other medications that you can add that can actually decrease the risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Number one is aspirin. Now this is something that I don't actually use in my own patients because I do worry about the bleeding risk of aspirin. But in the ASRM guidelines published in 2016, looking at ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome and risk reduction, they list two randomized controlled trials that showed that taking aspirin about 100 milligrams a day during stimulation, even through the retrieval, decreased the risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. So I'm sharing that because ASRM is my medical society and I want to share all the information with you. It's not something that I currently use in my own practice, but I'm always learning. Number two medication you could add that I do use in my own practice is metformin. Now metformin can be used to prevent ovarian hyperstimulation given at a dose of 500 milligrams three times a day or a total of 1500 or the 850 milligrams once in the morning, once at night. And the thought process of how metformin is decreasing the risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome is metformin is an insulin sensitizing agent. This is what is given to diabetics to help their body use insulin better. What's interesting though is insulin is intimately involved in egg recruitment and follicular development and taking it during the IVF cycle and patients who are at high risk of OHSS, it decreases the number of follicles that would develop that wouldn't actually give us a mature egg. So it's decreasing the overall levels of estradiol without compromising the success of the cycle. Most studies show a benefit in using it with metformin. The one I'm going to show here really used it for patients with diagnosed with PCOS, consistently showed lower chance of OHSS. This is one of our high risk factor groups. And so it's really something to think about. And it's just during the IVF cycle. The third medication to think about adding or using during the IVF cycle as far as prevention is the trigger shot. Now we got to talk about this. Traditional Traditionally, the way the body ovulates and you know matures the egg is our pituitary gland pumps out this hormone called luteinizing hormone. That is what you see the ovulation predictor kit turn positive in the middle of your cycle. That's what our body does. Now, it's actually really hard to bottle LH and it's really expensive. And for decades, the fertility community has been using HCG to mimic LH because they're only different by about three amino acids. So HCG is our traditional trigger shot. It works really well to trigger the final maturation of eggs, allows them to release from the wall of the follicle. So then we, we go in to get the eggs at the egg retrieval, they come. I have had devastating IVF cycles where people just did not take the trigger shot correctly, just didn't mix it, mix the wrong thing, whatever. They just did not get their HCG trigger. And we go, everything seems fine, but we go to the egg retrieval and all the follicles are empty. There are no eggs retrieved. And it's not that there weren't any eggs. This doesn't happen anymore because we test and check beforehand, but I have been in retrievals, you know, over 10 years ago where we're just draining follicles and there's no eggs coming. We stopped 
<laughs> retrieval, did a blood test and found that the patient had no HCG in their system. So the trigger shot is absolutely essential for success with an IVF cycle. If you don't get a trigger shot, you don't do it correctly, you could actually have no eggs retrieved. But the downside of HCG is it increases VEGF and it increases a lot of those substances that I talked about earlier in this video that lead to the leaky capillaries and leaky vessels and make the fluid shifts and the essential dehydration in your blood vessels worse. So the more HCG someone gets, and honestly, that can stay in your system for at least seven days, sometimes up to 10 days, the more leaky, the more fluid shifts, the worse sometimes patients can feel. Now we have learned that there is an alternative. So there's a different medication you can use for a trigger. It's called Lupron. And what Lupron does, if you take it in a big bolus, you can't take it if you're taking Lupron throughout the whole cycle. But if you're doing an antagonist protocol and you don't have any Lupron on board, if you take Lupron for your trigger shot, it will trigger your own pituitary gland to pump out luteinizing hormone. So you're tricking your own body into triggering it self. And that has decreased exposure to HCG. And it's an amazing option to decrease the risk of the symptoms associated with OHSS. There are pros and cons. If somebody only takes Lupron and their pituitary gland decides not to work and does not pump out LH, you essentially have no trigger and you could go to retrieval and get no eggs. And the other downside of Lupron is that you can't use it if you're going to use a fresh embryo transfer because it essentially shuts down the gonadotropins and the stimulation that's usually happening in your ovaries to help with estrogen and progesterone production to allow implantation and the appropriate endometrial development. So if you ask, well, why don't we just use Lupron for everybody for a trigger? Number one, someone's pituitary gland has to work to make this an option. Number two, they have to be on an antagonist protocol for their IVF cycle or else the trigger isn't going to work. Number three, people who want to do a fresh embryo transfer cannot use Lupron for their trigger. And number four, just so you know, it's significantly more expensive than HCG. In our practice, we often do what's called a dual trigger where we actually give a baby dose of HCG and um, Lupron. And then we do labs the day after to make sure that the patient responded, that we're seeing LH. And then we have that baby dose of HCG just on board and just in case their own pituitary gland doesn't work. So I could do a whole nother video just about trigger, but I hope you get the concept that HCG is a traditional trigger. It works really, really well for maturing eggs and doing what we need, but it makes the physiologic process that leads to significant OH OHSS much worse. And so if you know someone's at risk of OHSS, it's okay to talk about switching plans for the trigger to help them recover faster, but you got to go through all these different pros and cons. As far as impact on success of the cycle, there's an excellent study that looked at over 4,000 donor egg cycles and compared outcomes as far as egg maturity and blastocyst formation rate and pregnancy rate. If the donor got HCG trigger or Lupron trigger and there was no compromise in success of the cycle if a Lupron trigger was used. One additional medication that you can think about when you're thinking about prevention of OHSS is using a medication called cabergoline, which is a dopamine agonist, right around the time of retrieval and for up to five days after the egg retrieval. So this is something that you could always add if you're seeing somebody that's developing risk of OHSS, their estrogen levels are getting high. You can see their ovaries are getting bigger. They're developing free fluid. Cabergoline is traditionally used to decrease prolactin levels. So prolactin is a hormone that also comes from the pituitary gland. We talk about that gland a lot in fertility, don't we? Um, but giving an agonist to decrease the production of prolactin will also decrease the production of other gonadotropins and help the body recover from creating all of these substances that are causing the capillaries and the vascular system to be leaky, just helps the body recover faster. And so you could ask your doctor about cabergoline. It is listed in one of the options for treatment and prevention of OHSS in the ASRM or American Society of Reproductive Medicine. The practice guidelines were out in 2016. And finally, I know we've talked about a lot about prevention, knowing who's at risk, thinking about a protocol, thinking about medications to add, et cetera. The final component of prevention of OHSS is being able to adjust 
accordingly. And that means adjusting medications. That means adjusting plans. So as someone's going through the cycle and as as their doctor, if I'm seeing risks of OHSS, I can adjust the dose of the gonadotropins. I can change the plans for the trigger shot. And then I would really talk to somebody if my patient was really hoping for a fresh embryo transfer, but we are just seeing really high estrogen levels. We're seeing the ovaries enlarge. We're seeing free fluid in the pelvis. I will talk very seriously about switching our plans to a freeze-all cycle or freezing all the embryos because number one, people have a lower success rate if you do a fresh embryo transfer with OHSS. But number two, if they do get pregnant, they can get really, really sick. Because guess what the pregnancy hormone is? HCG. And so if someone gets OHSS from their trigger shot of HCG, at least after seven to 10 days, that hormone is out of their system. And then they can fully recover before they actually try to get pregnant. But if someone does do an embryo transfer and they do get pregnant, their body starts making HCG, they don't have a chance to recover and they have a pretty terrible first trimester. So it's all a discussion, pros and cons, informed decision-making between the doctor and the patient. That's something very strongly to consider. All right. So the final section of this incredible video on OHSS, treatment of OHSS, if someone gets it. There's four things that I really think about. Number one, and this is what most patients need, is just really good supportive care. So it's counseling, it's checking in on them, it's having them come into the clinic if they need after the egg retrieval. It could be if they're really dehydrated, giving some IV fluids. If they're really nauseated, we could give anti-nausea medication. If they're getting constipated, we have to pay attention to that. And then another thing that's really important, and I talk to my patients about doing this even before the egg retrieval and then as they recover, is increasing protein and electrolyte intake. Now, this is not in the ASRM guidelines, but this is something that I have done for years and I've seen incredible success in my practice to the point where we recommend it to all patients going through IVF. If you are essentially dehydrated and all the fluid is in your tissues and not in the bloodstream, something that you can do to get that fluid into your bloodstream so that you can take it to the kidneys, you can perfuse the rest of your organs is not only drink fluids, but electrolytes and protein will help pull fluid from the tissues into your bloodstream so you can pee it out so you can feel better. And electrolytes are sodium and potassium. I also like magnesium because it also helps with the constipation piece and protein and when you're feeling really full and bloated and nauseous and it's hard to eat, if you are eating, I think about like chicken soup and if you're a vegetarian, miso soup because they're both really salty and they got lots of protein. But another thing that is wonderful is getting electrolytes from the store and getting protein powders from the store. So Gatorade, a lot of my patients like it. I don't really love the sugar, but it's got sodium and potassium. Some people like noon tablets. Other people like Pedialyte. I love Element. It's an incredible sodium potassium, magnesium powder. I've worked with them and I'm learning a lot about hydration with them. They did not sponsor this video, but I just think they're an incredible option. They don't have sugar, which I think is really nice. So you can just put in a big water bottle, a packet of element or these other things I described, you know, protein powder, and you can just sip on it all day. And that is going to do so much more for you than just drinking water alone. So that is a huge, wonderful tip to help with supportive care during the cycle and afterwards. Other treatment options that I sometimes consider is anticoagulation. If someone is so dehydrated and so hemoconcentrated and they're not moving around a lot because they just don't feel very good, sometimes you have to think about giving blood thinning medication. An intense form of supportive care is hospitalization. I haven't had to do this in a really long time, but if someone really can't keep fluid down, we need to help them with pain control or keep them hydrated with an IV, we will admit them to the hospital. We want to take care of our patients. It's very rare and I truly can't remember the last time I did this. And finally, if there is just so much fluid being built up in the pelvis and in the abdomen, we can do something called a paracentesis. So we can actually drain the fluid. This is a last resort, but it is immediate relief for patients that are feeling really, really bloated. I mean, some people say, oh my gosh, Dr. Shaheen, I look like I'm six months pregnant. Like, I, I am so full of fluid. And then if we just drain that fluid and the way that we do it is actually very similar to what we do with an egg retrieval to make people comfortable. And then we just put a needle through the upper wall of the vagina into the pelvis where that fluid is collected and we just drain it and they leave feeling like a million dollars because finally their belly isn't so tight. And so it's not something that we do very often, but it's something that we can do to 
provide immediate relief. And then you've got to do all that supportive care too, just to really help people get past the symptoms and just take excellent care of them. I hope you learned something from this video. Make sure you like and comment and subscribe so you get my weekly videos. I really don't want to leave you scared about OHSS. I want to empower you to be able to have conversations with your doctor and just learn about what options are out there. So make sure you watch my other video, which is really patient centric about how to talk to your doctor about your risks, what options are available if you do develop OHSS and just ways and warnings to look for at home so that you can be the best advocate for your care. Thank you so much for being here. I just love educating. Make sure and comment with questions that you have. And as always, stick around for more learning. Thank you.